I would like to welcome all of you to the Emer Landau Human Rights Forum. This annual event was established in 2008 in, to honor the memory of Emer Landau by providing a continuing structure to help all people in our community of all ages commit to understanding that we treat each other with respect and tolerance. We have addressed such topics as civil rights, the right to food, the right to affordable housing, the right to an education free of bullying, and the rights of the LBGTQ community. A survivor of the Holocaust, he was an inspiration to young and old. Ewa Landau was a part of our community for many years. He believed in the importance of libraries for all people and was a member of Skidapra's board. He participated in the planning of this building. As a frequent speaker at schools, Amos' message always came back to human rights. We are honored today to have Carolyn Landau with us. She has lent her support to this annual event since its exception. Thank you, Carolyn. The forum committee members are Louise Belknap, Sarah Burkett, Stephen Dixon, Phoebe Nichols, and Mary Kate Rennie. I'd like to turn the program over to today's moderator, Stephen Nixon. Welcome. It's very heartening to see this very large crowd today. Either you guys like 10 o'clock or you like this topic. <laughs> and I think it's the latter. Uh, it's my job to introduce our speaker, Valerie Lovelace. She is the founder and executive director of It's My Death, a 501c3 nonprofit based in Wisconsin. And the mission is to provide services and education to people who wish to actively explore the meaning of life through embracing the certainty of death. Valerie founded It's My Death in 2014 to fulfill the promise she made to her younger sister who died in January of 2009 at the young age of 49, to teach others how to be with dying. It's My Death's primary programs are holistic individual and end-of-life consultation and community development through education and discussion on a variety of end-of-life topics. It's My Death's goal is to help people connect with death and dying as a part of living authentically and vulnerably. Valerie is a retired Navy veteran, an intuitive healer, and interfaith minister, an artist, and the mother of three adult children. She volunteers with the Funeral Consumers Alliance of Maine and a local hospice organization. Valerie earned her bachelor's degree at USM while serving in the, in the Navy and recently received her master's degree from Hudson College. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce our speaker, Valerie Lovelace. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here and uh, really happy to see so many faces. I'm honored to be here today and I'm grateful to the Forum Committee and Emil's wife, Carolyn, for inviting me. I received feedback earlier that there were a few folks feeling a little bit uncertain about today's topic, so I just want to put you at ease. I promise you that talking about death is not what kills you. <laughs> I never imagined I'd be doing what I do today. In early December of 2008, I received a call that changed my life forever. The voice on the other end was that of my little sister, who said simply, I have cancer, and it doesn't look good. I fell as silent as you are right now, unable at first to comprehend what she was saying to me. Since then, I've come to understand that there's something about getting close to death that causes us to go quiet. I think there's more to it than our denial of death or fear of talking about it, though our society does a really good job with that. 
But I believe it has something more to do with the very personal nature of our dying. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I'm moved by E. Melando's legacy and posthumous sponsorship of today's event. I find it quite beautiful that from beyond his death, he's made it possible for us to come together to consider our own. I'm inspired by this man who survived so much in his life and who witnessed such unspeakable atrocities. A man whose tattooed forearm marked him as one number among many numbers who suffered at the hands of the Third Reich. Emil's desire that we continue working for the concerns of human and civil rights is both humbling and daunting. He could have responded to his suffering in any number of ways, and yet he ultimately chose to take action and share his personal story. It's one thing when we nod our heads about human rights, and quite another to respond and engage in advocacy in a way that urges our society forward, respectfully, recognizing and embracing diversity of all kinds and under all circumstances. I'll speak about dying in that context today to honor Emil's memory, and I hope to excite within each of you a quest to discover a pathway to the ownership of your own living and dying. So you might be wondering what has dying at all to do with human rights? You may already have steadfast thoughts or beliefs about what should or shouldn't be permitted at the end of life. And I'm not here to change your mind about that. You see, my work is about reframing end-of-life discussions. Like generalizing a human rights discussion, generalizing a discussion about dying allows us to sidestep the intimacy of our own mortality. My feeling is that exchanging opinions about how dying should or shouldn't be really just helps us pretend we aren't all dying right now. I know I don't look much like I'm dying, but I am, and so are each of you. If I were milk, I would have an expiration date tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> the reality of life is that I'm expiring one breath at a time, right before your very eyes. There goes another one. <laughs> In fact, from the time I was born, I've passed the anniversary date of my death every year, completely unaware. And so have you. But what about the human rights part? I felt it best that I should understand exactly what a human right is. Imagine my dismay to learn that there is no specific definition, nor any source document to which I can point and say, here are all of the things to which we have a right by virtue of being human. And I searched everywhere. I checked the United Nations website for the High Council on Human Rights. I read the Declaration of Independence, I'm sorry to say, for probably the first time since sixth or seventh grade. I read the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, the Civil Rights Act, the Maine State Constitution, and the Maine Human Rights Act. Our rights as human beings are defined solely by legislation. And we have precious few of them and they have a history of being heavily influenced by special interest groups of one kind or another. And they are subject to change, even at a moment's notice, just as emails changed in Germany. I thought maybe I overlooked something, though, so I contacted a law professor friend of mine and put the question to him, what is a human right? To which he replied, and I'm quoting him, Something you may have access to that is generally agreed upon within a society that you should have access to it by way of being a human being to whom it could apply. Uh, I can't make that up. And I can't tell you how unhappy I was to hear that. So I pressed him further and I said, then what is a civil liberty? And I liked that answer even less. A civil liberty is the power or the right to act, speak, or think as one wants, without hindrance and restraint, but within the context of and limited by the law, which serves to maintain order for the common good. As you might guess, order for the common good is a little bit like a human right. It's undefined, it's changeable, and it depends on a society and its laws. And that is how a Jew goes to Auschwitz, and how a black goes to the back of the bus, 
and how an indigenous child is taken from a family and forced to a residential school, how an LGBT person is prohibited the legal protections of marriage, and how a dying person is removed from their home and the care of their family against their wishes to receive medical treatment they don't want. And on that happy note, let's talk about, about dying in Maine. For the first time ever, Maine's death rate has surpassed its birth rate. We are dying faster than we are being born. Right now, average life expectancy in the state of Maine for men is 76.8 years, and for women, 81.5 years. So just quickly, by a show of hands, how many of you in this room have already surpassed the life expectancy? Wow. So keep your hands up for just a moment. So for the rest of us, that means this number of people aren't going to make it. That's how averages work. <laughs> Prior to age 45 in the state of Maine, the top three causes of death are accidents, drug and alcohol, overdose, or suicide. That's just the top three causes. It's not every cause. After age 45, things slow down just a little bit. Our top three causes of death are cancer, heart disease, and lung disease. The older we get, the more likely it is that we'll die of a chronic disease. When we lump all ages together in, in Maine, our top causes of death are cancer, heart disease, lung disease, accidents, stroke, and Alzheimer's. Maine exceeds the national average death rate in cancer, lung disease, kidney failure, and Parkinson's. The good news is that since 1982, the top five causes of death in our state have remained fairly consistent. In other words, we aren't inventing new ways to die. But that's also the bad news. In fact, since 1935, heart disease, cancer, and stroke have been in the top five causes of death in the United States. After 80 years of tracking mortality data, one fact has been consistently confirmed by the Centers of Disease Control. None of us are getting out of this alive. <laughs> so what is a good death? And more importantly, how does one go about having one? Most would describe this as a desire to die at home in our sleep. So how many of you, just quick show of hands, how many of you want to die at home in your own bed? I know I do. <laughs> Right, so hang on just a minute, keep your hands up. So I would like the first row here to keep your hands up, and everybody else put your hands down, because you're not going that way. <laughs> if today's trend continues, only 30% of us will, will die at home. 70% of us will die in hospital or facility. So how many of you secretly hope that one day you just drop in your socks or you can quietly go to sleep and not wake up? Of course. Almost everybody in the room. I know. Sadly, if um, like just this group of people keep your hands up. <laughs> the reality in Maine is that 45 to 75, uh, between the ages of 45 and 75, around 80% of us won't die that way. 80% of us will not drop in our socks and will not die in our sleep. 41% of us will die from some form of cancer, 22% from cardiac uh, disease, hypertension, or stroke, and 10% from lung disease, and then there's a whole bunch of other smaller causes. Of all the many ways that adults die by chronic disease, it is more and more openly acknowledged that some deaths occur under extremely difficult or excruciating conditions that cannot be managed by conventional practices. I realize this flies in the face of what we would all love to believe and may run counter to what some of us have been taught or told. It certainly doesn't agree with an idealized version of a medically supervised death sometimes held up as model evidence that we have no need for aid in dying legislation. And yet the clear need is confirmed time and again through very personal stories. Just last Friday, I received another. Dear Ms. Lovelace, I have recently been through a very traumatic death experience with a close family member. Although we had wonderful care from hospice, the end was anything but peaceful. Her death was difficult and brutal. She was medicated, but the medicated didn't, medications didn't work well towards the end, and she literally drowned as her organs shut down. The experience was very difficult for her, and we were unable to give her comfort. This is not the first story I've heard, and I'm sure it won't be the last. 
As a hospice volunteer, I too have witnessed some pretty gruesome ways that people die. There are sounds and images that will never leave me. And it's for that reason that the California Medical Association recently dropped its opposition to medical aid in dying. The CMA president said, and I quote, as physicians, we want to provide the best possible care for our patients. However, despite the remarkable medical breakthroughs we've made and the world-class hospice care and palliative care we can provide, it isn't always enough. This is the same reason that the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine also stands neutral on this issue. In the draft decision paper last year, the organization acknowledged that physician aid in dying, and I'm quoting now, currently exists as both an explicit and covert practice across various jurisdictions in the United States. They went on to say, policy notwithstanding, the academy recognizes that in particular circumstances, some physicians assist patients to, in ending their lives, and some patients will continue to desire physician aid in dying. It's the reason that some people stockpile their medications. It's the reason some physicians go ahead and help patients under the table. It's the reason a hospice worker in Minnesota mysteriously said to me, what you do in your own home is your own business on the last day of my sister's life. It's the reason physicians and nurses sometimes speak in code, saying things like, if you give more than X amount of this medication, it will stop their breathing and then they make X amount of that medication available. Helping people who have a difficult death should not be a secret. It should not be a clandestine act, and it should not put families and care providers at risk. When California's law becomes active, almost one in six American citizens will live in a state that offers physician aid in dying as a safe legal end of life option for those who qualify. Sadly, because of sketchy media and opposition campaigns, there's a lot of confusion over what these laws offer. So I'll briefly explain what's permitted and who can qualify. In the United States, physician aid and dying means this, that a competent, diagnosed, terminally ill adult patient can request from their physician through a safeguarded process to receive a prescription for medication in a lethal dose, which means the quantity of it, to fill, take home, and later self-administer by mouth as death becomes more imminent. It means nothing beyond that, despite what any opposition says about the laws. So I want to emphasize a couple of points. The patient must be competent to make their own health care decisions at the time of the request. I've met folks who feel like if, if they request this and then later um, suffer with some type of a disability that causes dementia, that it would still hold true for them, and it's, that is not true. You must be competent at the time of the request. You must be terminally ill as confirmed by two physicians, judged as best as any physician can do to be within six months of dying. The patient must be able to take the medication on their own. No one else can administer it to them. The patient and physician must follow and document the process as outlined in that state's law. And the laws are quite clear that participation is voluntary and so is conscientious objection for all parties involved. Physicians, nurses, patients, pharmacists. In five states, Professional organizations and agencies have worked together with lawmakers and patients to create safe, sound policy that reflect, re, respects everyone's rights and beliefs. Currently, patient-directed end-of-life prescriptions are legally available in Oregon since 1997, Washington since 2008, Montana since 2009, Vermont since 2013, and now California starting in 2016. These prescriptions are illegally available anywhere else you can find a physician who is willing to help you in secret. The laws offer a safe, visible, and legal way to obtain a life-ending prescription for a qualified, terminally ill adult who wants that in addition to the other end-of-life palliative and hospice services they are receiving. Since 1997, a total of 1,327 patients in Oregon have requested the medication and 859 have died by taking it. In 2014, 93% of those patients who received a prescription were also enrolled in and receiving hospice services. What 17 years of data in Oregon has shown us is that having an aid and dying law dramatically improves the availability and use of palliative and hospice services. The only people opposed to the law in Oregon don't live in Oregon. 
<laughs> many, many people do outlive their prognosis, and that's very good news. One patient in Oregon lived over a thousand days after receiving their prescription. These laws don't encourage hasty decisions. As of 2015, nine independent studies have shown there's no substance to any of the allegations made by opposition. Every alleged case has proven unfounded. Not one court case can be cited as evidence of abuse of these laws. In fact, the state of Vermont commissioned one of those nine independent studies in 2008 as a part of their legislative process. Their 42-page report is available to the public and can be found on the state's website. So what does this mean for the 80% of us who are not going to drop in our socks or die in our sleep? Until such a law is passed in Maine, we just have more limited options. The first option, of course, is that you can move from Maine to a state where it's legal, like 29-year-old Brittany Menard and her family did. She was a resident of California where repeated attempts to pass a law, either by referendum or legislation, had failed. Brittany died in Oregon just a little over a year ago. Her story and the stories of many others were instrumental in getting the law passed in California this year. Governor Jerry Brown said on signing the bill into law, and I'm quoting him, the crux of the matter is whether the state of California should continue to make it a crime for a dying person to end his or her life no matter how great their pain and suffering. It was not an easy decision for the governor, who was a former student of the Jesuit priesthood. He wrote that he reflected on what he, want, he would want in the face of his own death, and in a letter to California lawmakers said, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill, and I wouldn't want to deny that right to others. When terminally ill and dying in Maine, if your physician writes you a prescription for a lethal dose of medication that you can take at the end, at the, end the law says that physician is assisting your suicide. When terminally ill in a state where the process is legal, if your physician writes you a prescription for a lethal dose of medication you could take at the end, the law says that physician has provided you with an end-of-life option you feel you need to have available to you while you are dying. The act is the same. It's the civil liberty and the public policy that is different. Choosing aid and dying is not a death decision, it's a life decision. Moving to another state is not a real estate option for very many. It means leaving your home, your family, your friends, and requires significant financial resources. So what else can you do? You can still plan ahead. Every adult should have an advanced directive. How many of you have an advanced directive? Good. That's really good. How many of you have a current advanced directive? <laughs> ah, okay. Not so many. But a lot. That's good. Don't wait until you're sick to complete one. While you are competent, complete your advanced directive and also assign an advocate, medical or medical power of attorney. This is called a proxy, healthcare proxy. On your directive, in addition to identifying who can make healthcare decisions for you, say who cannot. I just learned this. I didn't know you could do that. Say who cannot. This may prevent family squabbles over your dying body. <laughs> it's particularly unhelpful if your directive is not available to the person you've assigned as your advocate. <laughs> that happens a lot. It's even less helpful if they don't know that you've assigned them to your advocate. <laughs> that also happens a lot. Please keep in mind, even with a directive, it may not be honored. Quite often they are not, and there's a lot of reasons for that. An advanced directive is built on a number of assumptions, primarily that your healthcare advocate can be reached and is willing to insist on your wishes, that your advocate is allowed in that moment to even be your advocate. That happens a lot too. That medical personnel will agree to honor it, that hospital or facility policy will agree to allow it, and it assumes that you actually have access to the healthcare industry at all. In a short number of years, we've built an almost unshakable paradigm that our living and dying must be medically supervised. And it's not really true, but most people believe it is. It's really important that you understand that your advanced directive must be translated to a document called a POLST, P-O-L-S-T, Physician Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, and be signed by a physician in order to be enforceable if you are in a hospital or in a care facility. 
You do have a right to have your life prolonged as long as possible and to have all the medications and services that may be offered to you. You have a right to fully be fully informed about your health care condition. It doesn't mean you will be, but you have a right to be and you should insist on it. You have the right to be informed of the risks involved in any procedure, treatment, or medication being recommended to you. And you should insist on that too. You do have the right to refuse life-sustaining or heroic measures including do not resuscitate orders, withdrawal of feeding tubes or ventilators, and stopping feeding and hydration. Be aware that this can be made very difficult for you by well-intended others. Any advocate you choose to act on your behalf, if you cannot act on your own, should be fully aware of and in agreement with your wishes and prepared to stand their ground. They can't do that if you don't talk to them about it. You have the right, this is something a lot of people don't know, you have a federal right to exceed regulated dosing of morphine when you are dying, even if it means um, your, the, your life may come to a close sooner. This does, however, depend on your ability to express your level of discomfort. It depends on who's providing your care. It depends on your physician's understanding of end-of-life prescribing. Many physicians don't know that they can exceed that dosing. And whether your body can even tolerate the drugs. A lot of people have uh, trouble tolerating opiates. My father, when he was dying, couldn't tolerate morphine. You do have the right, this is not going to be easy to hear, you do have the right to die by your own hand. No state prohibits ending your life. In Maine, while those over age 65 do not have a high rate of suicide attempts, they have the highest completion rate of any other age group. I think that's pretty sad. Some who oppose aid in dying will actually say to a terminally ill person, you already have the right to kill yourself, including a California legislator who said during public testimony, go ahead and jump off a bridge if that's what you want. In states where aid in dying is legal, it is not considered suicide by the health care system or by the law. You have the right in the state of Maine to obtain a medical marijuana prescription, but only after failing to find, convention, uh, find relief with conventional methods for six months. Don't ask me why that's the law. I don't understand that. You have to pay for this prescription on your own. Be aware that most facilities will not allow you to have a medical marijuana prescription on their property, even if it's a non-smoking one. Obtaining marijuana outside of the regulated process for medical marijuana is not legal in the state of Maine. Modern society has eliminated or strictly regulated access to some of the most amazing plants and minerals known throughout history to help us with our health and our dying. In the old days, one called upon a shaman or the village healer, and they came with medicines from the earth knowing how to help us. We birthed our children and nurtured our dying at home. Our dying is as private as our bodies. No matter how many people are in the room with you, you are leaving here by yourself. In the end, you will be weak, unable to stand, unable to eat, and unable to enjoy the things that you most enjoy. That's not depression, that's dying. <laughs> if you're one of the almost 80% who isn't going to die in your sleep, you will become a prisoner of your own failing body. How do you want that to be for you and your failing body? Is aid in dying legislation controversial? Yes, it is. Are there ethical concerns that should be considered? Absolutely. Does an end-of-life prescription law demand careful and thoughtful legislation? It absolutely does. Be assured there are lawmakers, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, patients, and people from every walk of life and diverse group who fully understand the issues and concerns of dying, and they work together to draft sound policy to respect everyone's civil liberty, to participate or conscientiously object. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that any movement for social change is often met by general declaration that the change will mean the end of our orderly society. The same was said for abolition, women's voting rights, desegregation, freedom in reproductive rights, freedom in marriage, and has argued for every other social issue involving civil liberty. I want human rights and civil liberty to prevail in every cause and under every condition, even our dying. A small number of people need this kind of legislation. Less than one half of one percent of all the deaths in Oregon occurred through that state's law. If that number translates to Maine's population, it means that there's around 30 people in the state of Maine who have died this year or are currently dying, 
who have done so without the help they need. I know some of those people. Their doctors, even if willing, cannot legally help them. It hasn't been right in the past that special interest groups should dictate for the rest of us how our living ought to go, and it isn't right that special interest groups should dictate for the rest of us how our dying ought to go. I don't want to die the way someone else thinks I must. My hope is through honest and thoughtful consideration, we can find a way in our state to acknowledge the incredible intimacy and the very personal nature of our dying as the final event of a self-actualized individual human life. A physician in Massachusetts who is right now dying with stage four pancreatic was her recent testimony in that state. She said, I am an educated professional woman and I want to die in a way that exemplifies the way I have lived my life. I believe that when you know you're on your deathbed, you should have the right to make that journey in a way that is both meaningful and sensible to you. In closing, I'd like to borrow two lines from Mary Oliver's poem, The Summer Day. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And I'll leave you with a final question. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious death? Thank you.